the time of Lord Salisbury. Uh, 1892, I think. 1892, I think. You're, you're quite right. Uh, He's a historian. I won't say he's a lapsed historian. I think, as, as this book makes it clear, he's addressed a very complex issue. He's addressed the entire question of what prompted empire, what were the impulses of empire. And the answers he's come across, uh, which he's offered, can be seen by some people to be extremely heretical because rather than seeing empire as a grand project, he has seen empire in terms of individual impulses. It's almost like the, I think it was Bernard Potter's book, The Absent-Minded Imperialist, uh, a variation of that theme, which he's uh, explored here. Uh, what Kwasi will do is he'll read a few extracts from his book, which will give you a flavor of what it's all about. And then maybe we can uh, have some questions and we get into a conversation. Right. Excellent. Thank you very much for your kind words. What I've done is I've decided to um, look at three passages, quite short passages, explaining my motivation or my background in terms of how I got into this subject. The second uh, reading will be from about Kashmir which is obviously very relevant to today's international situation and also Indian uh, politics. And then the last uh, reading, which will be quite short, talks about Lord Kitchener, who served in India. But this passage relates to his service in Sudan, which was before he came to India, and also talks about what I think is the whole point of the book, which is all about individualism, this cult of individualism, which is often forgotten uh, in today's world but which the British Empire, my argument suggests, was very much uh, concerned with and was very much driven by a cult of individualism. Anyway, let me start. This is from my introduction. The British Empire has always been with me. My parents were born in what was then called the Gold Coast in the 1940s and had experienced the empire at first hand. My father entered secondary school in January 1956, less than 15 months before the Gold Coast became an independent as Ghana in March 1957. This school was designed on traditional Anglican lines, and although it had been founded only in 1910, it imitated older English establishments. The headmaster of the school was an Englishman of a type familiar in the colonies. He was a product of Winchester, England's oldest uh, boarding school, and Cambridge University. I visited the school at Isadal College in 2001 for the first time. I was struck by the grace and tranquility of its environment as the school stands high on a hill in Cape Coast, Ghana's oldest town, which had been colonized by the Dutch in the 17th century. I realized that very few schools in Britain enjoyed such a pleasant setting. And yet the story of the school since independence in 1957 reflected the turbulent, unsettled history of the country since that time. In 1960, there had been 600 boys at the school there were now over 2,000, and yet the facilities and infrastructure had remained the same. The shortage of money had not really changed the ethos of the place. Even though the school tried to shake off its imperial past, there were still many traces of the old order. The school had been transformed, but vestiges of the empire could still be seen, not least in the house system favored in British boarding schools and the honors boards in the dining room. The empire, in a certain sense, still existed, although it now clung on only in a twilight afterlife that carried an eerie echo of its original character. This book attempts to describe some of that afterlife by giving an account of country's experiences before independence and afterwards. The character of the empire is portrayed through the forgotten officials and governors without whom the empire would not have survived more than a few weeks. I have not written one of those books that purport to show that the empire was a good or a bad thing. I have tried to transcend that sterile debate. I have simply sought to enter, as best as I could, into the mentality of the empire's rulers, to describe their thoughts and their ideals and values. I argue that individual officials wielded immense power, and it was this that ultimately led to disorder and even chaos. Officials, as I hope to show, often developed one line of policy 
only for their successors to overturn it and pursue a completely different approach. This was a source of chronic instability in many parts of the empire. In many ways, the British were too individualistic, and the vagaries of democratic politics at home meant that a consistent line was seldom adopted. I have called this anarchic individualism. There was very little to stop the man on the spot, as he was called, by the colonial office officials from pursuing the, action of, uh, thought of, uh, the line of action uh, he thought best. So now I'm going to talk about Kashmir, where some of these individual decisions had huge ramifications uh, for the present and, and also uh, perhaps even the future. And the, the chapter that I, I'm going to read from describes the Maharaja, the last Maharaja of Kashmir, who was a phenomenally wealthy man, but also very vain and irresponsible. And the bit I want to read is after independence, he was struggling to keep some of his authority in Kashmir. But the Congress party was very hostile uh, to Maharajas and princes and people of that kind and actually removed him. And so I describe uh, his last hurrah, if you like. Bear with me. For a man who hoped, and this is the Maharaja, for a man who hoped that India would preserve his authority and the power of his family, the Maharaja was now behaving with a staggering arrogance towards the Indians. His conduct through 1948 became increasingly eccentric as he harassed and embarrassed his Indian friends. In the letter he wrote uh, to the government at the end of January 1948, he candidly said that he had acceded to the Indian Union with the idea that this union would not let us down, in the belief that his position and that of his dynasty would remain secure. Years of command and authority had blinded him to the point where in post-independence India, where real power lay. In April, he was ordering uh, Nehru to charter a special plane to take him from Jammu to Delhi. Urgent de decisions needed to be taken but these had to be delayed because the Maharaja could not be reached. It appeared that he did not know how to use a telephone properly. Later in the year, in September, the Maharaja was lecturing the Indian government on the correct protocol to be observed in celebration of His Highness's birthday. He pointed to the occasions when it was usual in the state of Kashmir to fire gun salutes, one of which, of course, occurred on the Maharaja's birthday. Naturally, there was no difficulty about this when the control of the army had been with him but now the Indian army was in charge. My birthday, he wrote, is on the 27th of September. Therefore, very early instructions may very kindly be issued, he graciously warned the government. The sadness was that the Maharaja still believed that his rank and family were important considerations in the political affairs of the new country, even though, as everyone knew, the Raj had ended. He found it difficult to adapt to the new situation. While the Na United Nations, as would become customary, merely fudged the issue of Kashmir, it simply endorsed the current position. A ceasefire was imposed on the 1st of January 1949, signed by uh, General Sir Douglas Gracie on behalf of Pakistan and by General Sir Roy Butcher on behalf of India. You'll notice that both generals of both armies are British at this point. Uh, the United Nations Commission for India and Pakistan did have a state that the question whether the state of Jammu and Kashmir would accede to India or Pakistan would be decided, quote, through the democratic method of a free and impartial plebiscite. The position of the Maharaja at the beginning of 1949 was still not clear. Thanks to his pomposity and tactlessness, he was antagonizing the Indians who were, after all, supporting his throne with their army. By the middle of 1948, Nehru could see that Harry Singh, the Maharaja, was hopelessly incompetent. My study of the Kashmir situation has led me to believe that the Maharaja cannot play, Nehru wrote. The Maharaja was fixated on small things. He didn't get the big picture. When there is an obvious possibility of his losing everything, he still wants to hold on to relatively simple things. To secular-minded modern Indian nationalists like Nehru, the Maharaja had shown absolutely no leadership. He had not, quote, led his people in the hour of crisis, but had left in the night for Jammu 
where his winter palace was situated. His summer palace, of course, was in Srinagar. He had left, moreover, in a caravan of tr cars and trunks, carrying his family, his jewels, as well as costly furniture and carpets from his palaces. This had been an ignominious betrayal, according to Nehru. The Pakistanis were implacably hostile to the Maharaja because he had signed his state over to India. The Indians had grown weary of his vanity, his grand airs, and his greed, as he kept complaining and asking for money. In May 1949, the government proposed to the Maharaja that he should leave the state and appoint his son, the Yuvraj Karan, as regent. This suggestion alarmed the Maharaja, who left his audience with uh, officials in a state of shock and bewilderment. He was, in his own words, completely taken aback by this proposal, which he hoped would not be a prelude to any idea of abdication. But that is exactly what it turned out to be. In May 1949, Nehru uh, was finalizing the details of a house in Bombay, which would be put at the Maharaja's disposal. Throughout the rest of 1949, Harry Singh, Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, quibbled about which bits of which properties belonged to him and not to the state of Kashmir. As an Indian politician acidly remarked at the time, it would be difficult to find any sane person in India who would agree that fishing rights or fishing lodges were essential to the dignity of a ruler. Meanwhile, the Maharaja had planned the wedding of his 18-year-old son, Karan, to a Nepalese princess. Uh, Tara Devi, the, uh, uh, the Maharaja's wife, uh, begged for the Indian state to settle an allowance on the young couple and to pay for her son's wedding. The letter may have been written by the Maharani, the Maharaja's wife, but no one doubted that the Maharaja had inspired this initiative. The Maharaja stopped being a factor in Kashmir's affairs at the end of 1949. He was asked to leave and he, deport, he, he departed uh, to live in exile in Bombay. There he sank back into indolent irrelevance as new political forces emerged to shape the destiny of the land he had once ruled. The Maharaja of Kashmir became a recluse and in the long days of his exile, he loved nothing better than to read illustrated books on castles and mansions of England, Europe and America. He also devoured books on architecture and engineering, on racing and polo. And polo. With this sedentary lifestyle, Harry Singh became even more obese and eventually developed diabetes. He died in Bombay on the 26th of April, 1961, aged 65. He had refused to take the insulin injections prescribed for him. A long bout of coughing brought on a heart attack, and when the doctor had arrived, his last words were simply, Doctor, I am going. I'm just going to read the conclusion of the, cha the Kashmir uh, chapter because I think it has um, some relevance. Beyond the personal tragedies, there lies the dangerous political situation, which continues to have serious implications for international politics. One curious legacy of the British Empire has been a strong Kashmiri community in England, which has been described as the real fountainhead of secessionism. Even more dangerously, the region is one of the places in the world where the threat of nuclear war is still very real. On the 11th and 13th of May, 1998, India carried out a series of underground nuclear tests at Pokhran. On the 28th and 30th of May, Pakistan conducted its own series of nuclear tests. Some sort of confrontation seemed likely. The Japanese Prime Minister Keizo Obuchi spoke of the urgency of resolving the root cause of the Indo-Pakistan conflict, Kashmir. More recently, Kashmir has been host to all types of, all types of Islamic terror groups who find in the state's lawlessness, relative lawlessness, a convenient cover for their activities. Between the 26th and 29th of November 2008, Mumbai witnessed more than 10 shooting and bombing attacks in which 173 people were killed. The group responsible for the attacks, lashkar e taiba had been active in Kashmir for more than a decade. One of the attackers mentioned Kashmir in a rambling interview with the India TV news channel during the siege of the Taj Mahal Hotel. Are you aware, he asked, how many people have been killed in Kashmir? This is an excuse which in itself proves nothing, except how politically sensitive the issue of Kashmir still remains. The Kashmir dispute from the very beginning has been a battle of different ideas of what constitutes a state. 
Pakistan was built as an avowedly Muslim state whose basis is the religion which, it was believed, united the country. India, under its Congress leaders, has always proudly maintained its secular status. According to one writer, the Battle of Kashmir is, quote, an uncompromising struggle of two ways of life, two concepts of political organization, two scales of values, two spiritual attitudes. It was exasperating for Indian leaders like Nehru to have to justify India's control of Kashmir, given that the religious argument in favor of Pakistan seemed compelling. It is ironic that since 1947, religion in the form of militant Islamism has, if anything, become a stronger current in international politics. At the end of 1948, Nehru complained, quote, that people cannot get rid of the idea that Kashmir is predominantly Muslim and therefore likely to side with Muslim Pakistan. This has always been at the core of the Pakistan case. It was the same argument made by Lord Mountbatten to the Maharaja in the summer of 1947 before Harry Singh's fateful decision to accede to India. It is the same argument that is heard from the mouths of Pakistani politicians today. Secular India, however, sees no reason why a majority Muslim state should not remain as part of India. Recent history has not moved in India's way in this respect. International politics in today's world, especially after the 11th of September 2001, has been dominated by ethnic and religious conflict by people identifying with religion to a greater degree than any Enlightenment thinker could have imagined. As George Orwell wrote in 1941, the energy that actually shapes the world springs from emotions, racial pride, leader worship, religious belief, love of war, all things which liberal intellectuals mechanically write off as, anachronism, as anachronisms. The dispute in Kashmir is highly representative of, quote, the energy that actually shapes uh, the world. Now, I want to finish off with a um, brief uh, reading about Lord Kitchener, because I think this, he more than any other imperial figure, reflects the individualism and the sheer uh, single-mindedness, if you like, with which empire was carried out. Um, and I think this goes to the core of a, of a much forgotten aspect of the British imperial experience. Kitchener's career had been extraordinary. It combined exoticism, glamour, and bravery. He enjoyed incredible success, being raised successively to a viscountcy and then to an earldom. He was made Knight of the Garter and a member of the Order of Merit. He was even given the grant of an estate. But more generally, Kitchener's career revealed certain truths about the nature of the British Empire. Kitchener was a great individualist. And it was this individualism that captured the imagination of his contemporaries. He enjoyed the vast spaces and solitude of the desert. Stevens, he was a Daily Mail journalist, uh, he conveyed this appeal of the desert to a certain type of solitary but tough Englishman, perhaps too reserved for more active social life. And this is a quote. The very charm of the land of Sudan lies in its empty barbarism. I have to say, this was written in the 1890s. This isn't my voice, but this is... Um, 1890s popular journalism for you. The very charm of the land lies in its empty barbarism. There is space in the Sudan. There is the fine purified desert air and the long stretching gallops over its sand. You are a savage again. You are unprejudiced, simple, and free. You are a naked man facing naked nature. Uh, Lord Cromer, who was governor general in Egypt, understood perhaps better than any other contemporary administrator the importance of individualism to the British Empire at its Victorian zenith. And I'm quoting from an essay he wrote in 1908. It has indeed become a commonplace of English political thought that for centuries past, from the days of Walter Raleigh to those of Rhodes, the position of England in the world has been due more to the exertions, the resources, and occasionally perhaps to the absence of scruple found in the individual Anglo-Saxon than to any encouragement or help derived from British governments. In Cromer's view, everything about the British pointed to individualism. Our habits of thought, our past history, and our national character all therefore point in the direction of allowing individualism as wide a scope as possible in the work of national expansion. Like so many imperial administrators, he distrusted democracy 
Parliamentary institutions were, quote, an exotic system which provided no real insight into native aspirations and opinions. Democracy would enable, in Cromer's view, a small minority of natives to misgovern their countrymen. As far as imperialism was concerned, Cromer believed that the French allowed, quote, no discretionary power to his subordinate. And this meant that the junior administrators in the French colonies relied in everything on superior authority. The British official, however, whether in England or abroad, is an Englishman first and an official afterwards. He possesses his full share of national char characteristics. The Englishman was, I quote, by inheritance an individualist. The British system, according to Cromer, bred a race of officials sympathetic to individualism and gave, quote, a far wider latitude than those trained in the continental school of bureaucracy would consider safe or desirable. Now, this may have been an idealized picture, but if it was a myth, it was something the British imperial classes felt strongly about themselves. Colonial administrators tend to share, tended to share Cromer's view. Empire was all about individualism. It was about character and personality, about the rule of the strong man who, through a mixture of personality, intellect, and leadership, could dominate his peers and the world around him. Kitchener was the model imperialist in this respect. As one biographer has noted, Kitchener was an individualist of great conceptions who centralized every species of authority in himself. Such a man was useless at teamwork. During the First World War, he was frustrated by politicians and could not relate to them because he was an imperialist. He was an individualist and not a Democrat. He was an individualist who believed in his own destiny and in the power of strong-willed individuals to shape the world. This view would become more prevalent with fateful consequences in other European countries as the 20th century unfolded. Thank you, Kwasi. And I think one of the most important facets of this book, one is the fact that when we study history, especially something as complex as the empire, we cannot separate it from very, very important individuals, their personalities, their quirks, their angularities, even eccentricities, which played a very important role. And the second important thing which comes out of Kwasi's book is that when we talk about empire, I think it's very instructive to see it in totality rather than see it in terms of compartments, whether you see it in terms of Nigeria, Sudan, Southern Sudan, or India. Because all of them, there is a thread which runs through all of them. And I think one of the shortcomings of the uh, sort of schooling system is we tend to compartmentalize it. We see India as separate from what happened in, the, in say, for instance, parts of Africa. Now, the struggle between a Whitehall-dominated or the colonial office-dominated idea of empire and the man on the ground, I mean, there were no women at that time on the ground, True. Uh, uh, and the man on the ground, is a dispute which is, which is recurrent. That's right. I mean, in India, we saw the most famous dispute between Curzon and Kitchener, That's right. which was basically on the question of who controls empire. Who controls in the British India? Is the decision making to, to be decided in Calcutta or is it to, to be settled in the India office in London? Sure. Uh, but what I'm not sure about is that there were never any single answers to any no. of these questions. No. The colonial office ran something which extended from Aden to Zanzibar. That's right. Uh, you know, if you, you remember, the, if people might have seen this very obscure film called Carlton Brown of the FO. <laughs> Hilarious film which was made in the 50s where they suddenly discover that there is a part of the empire which had completely been forgotten and the treaty which made it over to the British Empire had been eaten over by rats. <laughs> um, so. So I wonder whether all the sins of post-colonial sins of all these places can therefore be lumped under the overarching theme of empire, which is perhaps, I suspect, what you're doing. Well, I'm not sure I'd go that far. I mean, clearly there was a, always this tension between the center, between Whitehall, 
and what was actually happening on the ground. But my argument, and that what I was trying to say in the passage that I read about individualism, was that the very culture of empire and the way in which these people had been brought up and the way in which the ruling classes in England thought about themselves meant that individuals were, the man on the spot was expected to, quote, get on with it, largely. Yes, there were tensions, but the whole philosophy and the culture of uh, these ruling elite was one in which if you had the character and the guts and the gumption, you were expected to go out there and essentially you were given much freer reign than I think we would, we would recognize would, was prudent uh, today. And the, the argument that, that's running through the book is that in lots of regions, this individualism created inconsistency because what happened was that uh, as one individual, as a governor general perhaps of Hong Kong, left governor of Hong Kong and another came in, policy was often reversed and that created instability. I mean, a classic case of this was in Sudan, which um, in 1930 there was a southern policy which uh, split Sudan in two. Essentially the northern Islamic part was separated from the southern uh, African part, as they called it. Uh, and there were very strict laws as to which parts you could go to. In 1946, and it was a man called Harold McMichael who was the architect of this policy. In 1946, the policy was completely reversed. The two regions were put together, and independence followed quite soon after that. And of course, that created a tension because you had a whole generation of people in the south of Sudan who had not been taught Arabic, who had not been taught how to integrate with the north, and that exacerbated the problems. And um, one of the ghosts of empire, one of the pleasures of writing the book was that a lot of the ramifications of what was going on that I was describing were actually coming to fruit as I was writing. So for example, the Southern Sudan became a country in 2011, uh, and it's the newest country in the world. So um, the, the, the core of the book is very much about individuals and about individual decision making. And I don't stress the role of Whitehall. I think that's been overstressed. And I know a little bit about the nature of politics. I know that when governments come in, they have completely different agendas. An undersecretary uh, of the colonies probably wouldn't be able to say on the map where these colonies were if, modern politi if ancient politicians were anything like modern ones. Um, and you read accounts of people you know, filling an office maybe for six or seven months, whereas p the people on the ground would be there for 20 years. So it, given the structure of democratic politics, given the frequency of elections, it was quite a turbulent time in the late uh, 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, it was inevitable, I think, that the individual would be given um, huge responsibility. Uh, you, you say inconsistency was the problem. Uh, I think, by and large, the British Empire ran on the strength of inconsistency, <laughs> you would say. Uh, for example, the administrative culture of Punjab was very different from the administrative culture of Bengal, That's right. which was different from the Madras presidency. That's right. So you had different variations all along. And it was all justified. Maybe Lugard was the later to sort of philosophize the entire question of informal empire, sure. dual mandate. So, but the norms which were set for Bengal could not be applied to Baluchistan. That was one of the basic principles. And it was a very effective arrangement. But your book also suggests that things started unraveling when the newly independent states started attempting a degree of consistency into the whole thing. So in hindsight, wouldn't you say that the uh, inconsistencies of the empire were far more prudent? I, I wouldn't say that. I think, the, I think, I mean, you're right to say that it was incredibly flexible. So the approach, as you say, in Bengal, the approach in Sudan, the approach in Iraq, it was all very different. There was no template, if you like, whereas, uh, empires, I think like the French Empire, were much readier to design a template and sort of force the, the countries into that uh, template. Whereas the, the British Empire was very pragmatic. But I think the problem with, in, with the um, individualism and the pragmatism, if you like, I mean, G.K. Chesterton famously said the problem with pragmatism is that it doesn't work. And I think a lot of that, uh, the truth in that statement, can be applied to empire. I think pragmatism less, le led to inconsistency, but not only inconsistency in terms of geography, but in terms of time. And that was where um, the biggest risk was, because you had these reverses of policy.
which meant that the situation was much uh, aggravated. Um, and I look, if you look at Hong Kong, this is an ex a classic example of this. The governor in Hong Kong after the Second World War wanted to bring a degree of, of democracy. Um, but of course, he left in 1947. The next man in had uh, completely, a uh, man called Alexander Grantham, had a completely negative idea of democracy and stalled democracy. He killed it. And of course, that had um, repercussions when Chris Patton came uh, to Hong Kong in the 1980s. Your point about post-colonial governments, I think, you know, once they were given these nations, once they took control of these nations, of course they had to impose some sort of consistency. I mean, that's what a nation state does. Whereas an empire um, obviously can be much more flexible and ad hoc. Well, it's, that's one of the recurring debates in India, whether the one size fits all policy is really workable or whether in a country like India you need far more varied approaches. Sure. And um, certainly I, I think we've, uh, we've something to learn from the de degree of flexibility which was applied. Sure. Um, but one of the recurrent themes, again, a, com a unifying theme of this is the importance of the man on the ground. That's right. And particularly the ethos That's right. which sort of shaped the, the selection of such sure. people. And I think at uh, one place you write, the ideal of the gentleman was a cardinal concept of empire. That's, that's right. And you talk about the subsequent socialization in the process of clubs which were sure. there, the, the shared backgrounds of being from the common schools, universities, yeah. schools, the Sudan political service probably being a, the most extreme example right. of uh, being an entirely rugby playing, uh, rowing, sure. uh, Oxbridge background. Sure. This is seven, you mentioned about 75% well, of the in intake of one year was entirely Oxford. A certain yeah. type of people would prefer it. Now, that might seem completely archaic and non-politically sure. correct sure. in today's. But did the idea of that, I mean, remember there were, there were just a tiny minority That's right. of handful of people ruling over a vast, very, very different thing. Sure. Did those values play a role in the fact that by and large, until the 60s, until the Indian infection caught on, empire was relatively stable? I, I, I'm not sure how stable it was. I think ethos and culture is very much at the center of what's going on in empire. And I think it's very difficult for us now at the beginning of the 21st century to realize how hierarchical and structured British society was certainly until probably 1939. You know, what school you went to, what university you went to, um, all of those things were incredibly, which regiment you served in, they were incredibly important. And men, and they were generally men, really identified themselves with these institutions in a way that you couldn't imagine now. I mean, for example, they used to have school dinners uh, the whole time, and they would describe these school dinners, you know, the old Herovian dinner in Baghdad, for example, or, or, or and, and, and that sort of culture um, and it was very male, it was very ma regimental, it was very uh, structured. I think that dominated empire. That doesn't mean that all the people who went through this system thought exactly the same things. And I, I stress that they all had different uh, notions of what they were trying to do. But there was an overarching ethos. And you see that ethos in a lot of the post-colonial countries. I mean, in India, you had the Doon school elite, didn't you, in the 90s or the 80s. Um, and in, in Pakistan, you've got Aitchison College. In uh, Ghana, where my family are from, you've got Achimota and these sort of elite schools, which can even now produce um, a, a much bigger proportion of leaders in business and politics and so forth than one might uh, imagine. And this was very much, I think, a product of, of the empire. And, the, and, the, and that's something that's easily forgotten, I think, today, in terms of how structured um, this, this ethos was. And in terms of um, actual characteristics, I think there was a, a sense of Fair play. Um, it's no accident that cricket is the great imperial sport. I mean, very few countries outside the empire, the old empire, play cricket or took on cricket. There were moves to introduce cricket in Germany, but the Nazis suppressed that. And I believe that in Holland, um, you know, there's still cricket played. But the em cricket is the, em is the game of empire. Well, Holland, is not Holland bad. isn't bad. I, I'm, I'm rude about the Dutch uh, efforts at cricket. A lot of them are English uh, expats, but, but, uh, but they play well. And, and so uh, cricket, if we look at cricket, you know, there's, there's, there's the fair play, um, there's the, you appeal to the um, umpire, 
the umpire doesn't actually sort of weigh in. It's quite an old-fashioned game. It's, as an American points out, it, you, you, how can you play for five days and still end up with a draw? Um, you know, and, and, and so uh, cricket, in, in, in many ways, typifies the kind of ethos, if you like. Um, uh, uh, leadership, you know, the team captain uh, has a huge role to play in cricket. And I think that um, em you've got to understand empire through these sort of cultural uh, values and, and, and through this uh, ethos. And again, um, I think cricket is, is a very good way of describing what I'm trying to say. It's a very individual game. But of course, there is a team uh, as well. You know, the individuals have statistics. They have, you can play really well and your team can still lose. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's probably quite a good metaphor for a lot about, about empire and the values of empire. Yeah. Uh, there's another facet of your book where, say, for example, when you're comparing Kashmir and Burma, mm. you talk about how Kashmir would probably have been better off if it had been formally absorbed into the empire, whereas Burma, it was completely a strategic miscalculation on the part of Randolph right. Churchill and Dufferin to have, act to have ousted the monarchy from Burma. Right. Now, to your mind, did formal empire was formal, being a formal part of the empire a cut above the informal empire? I, I, I don't think it was. I mean, I think the, the interesting point about that was about the, the treatment of Kashmir and the treatment of Burma was how inconsistent it was. And this goes to what we were saying earlier. Um, as a result of uh, the, what they used to call the Indian Mutiny, um, the independence movement in 1857, um, there was a, a real move to have informal empire, to have native rulers, as they call them, uh, indirect rule, so that they, you would have a figurehead like the Maharaja of Kashmir, um, and you would rule through him, um, but trying to preserve the fig leaf of some form of nominal independence. Whereas in Burma, exactly the opposite uh, idea was promoted. The Burmese had had a, a monarchy for hundreds of years, the ruling family in Burma had, been, uh, had held the monarchy for 120 years by 1880. And it was very, it was almost contrary to the, the principles of the time that Britain should move into Upper Burma and forcibly remove the uh, king and annex Upper, Upper Burma to empire. It was completely contrary to the whole drift of policy um, that had developed since 1857. And so, again, I've, I've said that this was a, fu a function of strong-willed individuals um, driving a policy which was entirely inconsistent with uh, what was the stated um, idea. And the problem with that, in terms of Burma, was that uh, essentially the British knocked out um, the social structure of Burma. The, the king, the noble families, they were all essentially made redundant. And a lot of them were actually uh, Tibor, the last king of Burma, died in India. I mean, he was forcibly removed. He was exiled from Burma. And, and that, again, was a, 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 a cause of instability. But I think the, th that was the point I wanted to make about Burma and Kashmir. It was a completely different um, policy. Uh, in Kashmir, you created a, a monarchy. In Burma, you removed one. Um, and, and, and again, this is what um, I say created a, a huge amount of instability going forward. Uh, before I uh, sort of invite questions, uh, I, I just want to know, uh, you've written by and large a not unsympathetic account mm. of empire mm. in the context of a terribly angst-written contemporary Britain. Sure. Uh, and the fact that you're of Ghanaian origin. That's right. I, I read somewhere that, uh, that you, you were called the Black Boris Johnson. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure. What, whether that's quite. a compliment or whether... <laughs> exactly, I'm not exactly. sure how to take that. Uh, <coughs> how has your book generally been received in the UK? I think it's uh, very interesting. I mean, it's, I think I'm doing the right thing because on the left, they say I'm an apologist for empire. And on the right, they say I'm um, attacking empire. So if you're being attacked by the neocons and you know, the Marxists, I think you're probably on the right ground, frankly. Um, but I think in terms of the, what I tried to do in the book is to try and move beyond um, a lot of the debates that we've had in the last sort of 30 years. In the 1970s, you said, you know, under sort of Marxist interpretation, 
empire is all about rape and pillage and bloodshed and um, racism and it's just purely negative um, experience. But of course a lot of people, and I spoke to my parents, I spoke to people who lived under imperial rule, certainly in the late uh, mid 20th century, they have some fond memories of it. I mean if you go to Jamaica, people, uh, elderly people will talk about British rule with surprising fondness. And I'm not talking about the earlier part of Jamaican history, which was bloody and horrible in the, in the sort of late, uh, up to the late 19th century. I'm talking about that sort of um, Indian, Indian summer, if you like, um, part of empire, uh, between the wars uh, until independence in the early 60s. People had some sort of fond memories of it. And also, so I was against the Marxist view. I thought, let's try and be even-handed here. And of course, in the, in the last 15 years, we've had people, you know, brilliant historians like Neil Ferguson, say that actually empire was the most amazing thing that ever happened. It created democracy, it created uh, liberal capitalism, uh, it created a global trading system. And I've tried to steer a middle course between these two extremes, because obviously history and life are much more complicated than that. And that's why um, the book takes a, a slightly measured um, trot through this quite dangerous middle path. Hmm. I, I think that's a question which uh, we is remains unresolved in sure. India. I think uh, there is the temptation to uh, decry everything, yeah. particularly on Republic Day. Uh, and uh, equally, there is a very thriving Raj nostalgia industry, absolutely, absolutely. which is a great boon for tourism in this country. <laughs> uh, the virtues of globalization, whether India's entry into the global markets was made easier by the entire imperial experience is mm. another uh, facet, the, uh, the familiarity with the English language, Absolutely. and the fact that you've become the center of the cricket economy, <laughs> if not the cricket Absolutely. hierarchy, uh, all these things. Uh, but these are just stray thoughts. I, I wonder if, I, I mean, there are lots of things in Kwasi's presentation which gives rise to questions. Uh, I see a number of hands, surprising number of hands. Maybe the gentleman. Oh, thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating talk. Um, I have several questions, perhaps you could answer one of them. Uh, firstly, could you tell us a little more about the process of researching the book? Uh, it's obviously about history, but it sounds as though it's mainly developing uh, uh, um, an argument. Uh, secondly, was the concept for the book clear before you started? How many questions are you going to ask, sorry? It's only about methodology, is it? Okay. Yeah, let's start with that one. Um, in terms of research, I think as a historian, you have to start with the primary sources. But of course, you've got certain ideas in your head about what might be interesting. But I didn't actually know what I would come up with before I started researching the book. I knew that I wanted to write a book about imperial experience in these six countries and find out what, um, you know, see what I found out about them. But in terms of actually formulating an argument, I think that comes really towards the end of your research. Not quite, not, certainly not at the beginning, and probably not even halfway through. And, and the most gratifying thing for a historian is when you've got an idea coming up with uh, some sort of confirmation. So I had this idea that individuals, after about halfway through the research and looking at primary documents, looking at diaries, looking a lot at the National Archive, um, the colonial office records, the foreign office records, uh, which are immaculately kept um, in queue. Um, about halfway through, I had this idea that actually individualism was a key concept and that it's something that we've forgotten. In the world, you know, government is a much bigger part of our lives than it would have been, would have been the case before 1914, certainly. Um, I, I, I thought, well, yes, individualism, let me examine this notion. And then, almost by complete chance, I was reading these essays of Lord Cromer uh, and, and I quote extensively as I read from them because he put, he, the, the essay was written about 1908, it was 100 years before I started my research, but he, he, he expressed this notion of the, the cult of individualism uh, much better than I uh, could have expressed it. And of course he's a contemporary source. So that's a really thrilling moment where you have a hunch and it's borne out in the actual um, in the actual archive, the actual evidence. So I don't think you get very far if you have preconceived ideas, because you'll miss a lot of, uh, a lot of detail and a lot of nuance. But uh, you know, your ideas evolve. 
And then after a while, probably about two thirds into the research, maybe a bit later, I think your, your, your thoughts can be formulated and, and you, you can come up with a theory. If, if that, I mean, theory is probably too grand a word for what I was doing, but, but you, can, you can come up with ideas. Uh, and that's, that, that would describe the, my process uh, yeah. in terms of writing this book. I think you've touched on the methodology question quite exhaustively. Sorry, uh, uh, gentlemen next to you. Um, but wouldn't you think that uh, the encounter between Br uh, British culture and uh, India is unique, given that uh, India is probably the only civilization that has strands to it that remain unbroken for thousands of years? Uh, and the time framework means that um, Britain has known two empires, the Roman Empire and the British Empire, but India has known many. Sure. And when you look at the uh, relationship between uh, Indian culture and English, what's striking for a foreigner is that it feels not like the uh, language of a, a, a colonial ruler, but yet another Indian language. <laughs> that's a, that's an, an interesting idea. I think that, I mean, reams and reams and reams have, have been written on the, the Indian uh, and the British relationship. Uh, people talk about the British love affair with India. And in terms of the British Empire, India was about 350 years, this relationship from the foundation of the East India Company till independence in 1947. And you're right to suggest that there was no other jurisdiction, there was no other country which had the, the depth and the length of, of experience. Um, so the African Empire was really a product of the late 19th century. Um, it didn't really have, it may have had roots people say about this in the slave trade, but it wasn't, it wasn't an administrative empire until the late 19th century. The American empire, the North American empire, um, which was actually at that time in the 17th century, that's what people thought of as the British empire, was the North American colonies. That was the real strength of, of the, what was then the British empire. But of course that ended in 1776 when they declared independence. So India's really the only thread between the Elizabethan Empire, if you like, the time of Raleigh and, and Drake, or Drake's a bit before that, but, and, and, and afterwards. Sorry. What? I, guess what, I guess what I'm suggesting is that actually, uh, oh, oh, sorry. In, in terms of the t uh, kind of cultural time framework, that uh, Indian, uh, Indian history is much wider, and the British are actually a blip. In, in yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean the, 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 the statement that Indian history is much wider, I, I think other cultures did have a, you know, they had a history. Um, I mean, you could, you, could, you could say that maybe it wasn't as sophisticated or as advanced, but, you know, they would, they would argue that. I mean, there were kingdoms in West Africa, certainly in the uh, large parts of the Islamic world. They had, they had long traditions. Um, so I'm not sure that the, 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 that point you were making is necessarily um, true. But, but, but in, the Indian, in the Indian case, you're right. India did have exposure to other empires. Uh, uh, the British Empire in India uh, happened much after the declared principle of trade, not territory, of mm. East India Company sure. uh, started. But not just they built an, a political uh, power structure here and uh, milked the economy, but there was also a huge intervention in the social uh, sure. arena. You had uh, an intervention in the education system, also the spiritual cultural traditions here, and there was a huge intervention of missionaries in proselytization. Have you, how have you dealt with that aspect? Of well, I talk about it in, in, in um, sort of individual cases. I don't have a big theory about uh, missionaries or, or what have you. But what I would say is that you could, there are two ways of looking at this. One way of looking at it is, is to suggest the depth of relationship that you, you have posited. The other one is, to, is a, almost a revisionist view and say, actually, if you look at the numbers of people in British India, uh, the numbers of British people, it was very small. I mean, even at that time, even in 1900, India had a population of two, 300 million. Um, and the number of actual British officials was very, very small. Um, and so the actual interface, you could argue, was a lot uh, narrower. Uh, than, than everyone is led to believe. And I think that, I mean, you make the good point about the East India Company. The East India Company um, had an army. It had, you know, people like Robert Clive. I mean, he was uh, very much involved in politics and administration. Except you're right to suggest it was more behind the scenes. It was a looser, uh, less structured um, imperial government. But what I would say is that I think that 
people can get obsessed with the imperial uh, experience. And, and actually, if you look at India, and you look, and as the gentleman suggested, India's history, um, I would suggest that the British Empire was, again, just an episode of that. I don't think it was something which um, is going to dominate India for, for, forever. Um, and I think in England, if you look at what, what's happened to England, yes, there are people, it's a multicultural country as a legacy of empire, but it's amazing the level of ignorance about empire that there is in Britain um, and the lack of knowledge. Uh, and so it was really like, uh, you know, two ships are passing in the night in many ways. Um, you would expect uh, more knowledge of empire, more experience, if you like, of empire in Britain than, than, than is the case. Yeah, I think Enoch Powell used to say that it's because of the ignorance of empire within Britain, which yes. is one of the reasons why Britain couldn't hold on to it. That's right. <laughs> uh, the gentleman there. Then I'll come to you. Uh, hi. Uh, so you spoke about individualism. And what's unique about Britain's history or their culture that it's the birthplace of individualism by Britain? And do you think individualism is the reason why the English football team had the lo one of the <laughs> lowest possession <laughs> statistics in Euro 2012 and why uh, the English team isn't really known for passing? <laughs> um, I'm not sure about that last uh, bit of your question. Um, yeah, I mean, liberalism, individualism, I mean, the, the, that's a huge question in terms of... Uh, British identity, British culture. I think Cromer put the point quite well. He, he, he dated it really, I think, from the 16th century when he was talking about Walter Raleigh and, um, and uh, uh, Drake and those sort of people. And if you wanted to be very historical about it, you would say, well, if you look at Britain's position in Europe, and this is, you've got to understand the European context. Britain was an island on the northwest of Europe with a very small population. And it had to compete with countries like France, um, which had four times as many people, right up to about 1750. Um, it was a maritime uh, nation, so it had to trade in order to get wealth. And I think these circumstances lent themselves to the kind of, you know, the old sea dogs like Raleigh and Drake, the kind of freebooters, um, that kind of uh, individualist and slash capitalist um, enterprise. So you look at Raleigh, you look at the East India Company, these are people who are, you know, it's, it's quite unimaginable. Or the Mayflower that went to America. They spent three months on that ship before they got to uh, New England. Um, and, and this is in 1620. So the kinds of people that are making these sorts of uh, journeys are, are very individualistic. But I would suggest, if you were to use a, a kind of almost like a Marxist type argument, the economic situation of England on the fringes of Europe and the fact that it was a, a, an island. Um, actually drove this kind of mentality. But, you know, the, 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 these theories have been debated uh, for centuries about why a sort of individualistic or liberal form of capitalism should have been developed in England at the time it was. Yeah. He's got a question for you, I think. Uh, my question is to Mr. Dasgupta. Sorry for asking sure, him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why still in India, people have such a great nostalgia about the British Empire, despite of so many days have happened. <laughs> and also, uh, Britain itself has become such a weak economic power, strategic power, even in our defense. It is on a real, real fringes. And of course, the cricket, where except for the recent performance. <laughs> other way. The so cricket was it's, good. it's a very strange thing, though we go to America, we, uh, you know, we are closer now to China. I mean, uh, we have a relationship with China, et cetera. But Britain still remains the, I would use the word supremo. Um, I'll, 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 quali I'll qualify that somewhat. I, th I think there is a, a, an underlying grudging admiration of the British Empire, which doesn't necessarily extend to a similar appreciation of contemporary Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that that would be fair to say, and I think there are a lot of American influences which have been coming in. But what are these facets of the British Empire? I know it's terribly incorrect, but there's a term used to be called the Queen's Peace, which has really existed for about 90 years. And I think that had an enduring effect in terms of a certain degree of stability as far as 
administrative and fiscal structures are concerned. And on top of that, the, uh, I know social pundits uh, referred to it in terms of missionary activity, but if you really look, look at it in terms of what happened in, uh, say, uh, southern Sudan or parts of Nigeria, the tinkering with social indigenous institutions in India were relatively far less than anywhere else, which is why both have coexisted simultaneously, which has certainly not been the case with sort of Francophone Africa. That's right. Or the, uh, I mean, the Germans didn't have their empire for too long, no. but they were incredibly brutal, or even the Belgians. Sure. So to that extent, I think there's been a, uh, the, ex I think what's held reprehensible about the British Empire was the informal apartheid system, racial apartheid, which existed. And uh, my great, I, I don't know what to call him, if you read Nirad Chaudhary's, uh, some people would say infamous book, The Autobiography of an Unknown Indian, written in 1952, and he dedicates it to the British Empire in India. He said, which conferred subjecthood on us, but withheld citizenship. And, and he also goes on to add, because all that was good and living within us was ripened, shaped, and quickened by the same British rule. Now that's probably an extreme statement, but I think from those extremities, you might get a glimpse of why there is this ambivalence, appreciation plus dislike of the British Empire in India. Thank you. Uh, so don't ask me questions, and last two questions. Excuse me. Uh, can I ask you, uh, both of you, if you have any views about the future of the British relationship with their colonies, with especially, I mean, more so with India, especially now that there is talk about the British leaving the EEC and perhaps uh, re-cranking the, the Commonwealth? <laughs> I, I think... I mean, the, your question goes to the heart of a kind of um, ambivalence that Britain has had since 1945 about its role in the world. And it was Dean Acheson who said, you know, Britain has lost an empire but has yet to find a role. Um, and I think that's true. I think Europe was uh, an attempt, if you like, to try and redefine what Britain was. And I described earlier that Britain is just an island on the northwest of Europe. You know, it's very much on the fringes of Europe. And that drove, for many centuries, its history. It's, you know, it's empire, the quest for trade, shipping, all those sorts of things. And I think today it's very difficult um, to, 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 to find a role because what happened was that the empire ended and we went into Europe. And what has happened is that the empire has almost struck back. I mean, if we look at India, if we look at parts of the Commonwealth and look at the economies of those countries, they're growing much faster uh, than Europe. I mean, the Eurozone is in a bit of a malaise at the moment. And I think there's a move in England to try and reconnect with um, some of the Commonwealth countries uh, and, and, the, and the emerging economies. And we're still trying to balance that question. I suspect that over time, we will probably be trying to look out more outward. Um, I think we'll probably stay within the, Euro, the EU. But I think we're, you know, there's, a, there's a definitely an attempt to try and uh, uh, engage more with, with, with a lot of those imperial connections that we have. Uh, no, 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 no more from you. Uh, positively, the, uh, yeah, yes, you gentlemen, there you stood up last. I'm sorry, please buttonhole Kwasi when he goes out and ask your question. Sure. Uh, either question. Since the book is about individuality and the individual impact, uh, what might Hari Singh have done, if you'd care to speculate, if he was not sure. as self-indulgent as you described? The second one, and choose only one. Uh, isn't it pointless? You correctly said, look, I'm not going to judge colonialism, mm. but isn't that impossible? Because you're either, a, whether you judge it by, as one of Marx's children or one of the Queen's servants, all the instruments that you'd ever use to pass judgment on colonialism are in fact a product of sure. that. And therefore, no judgment is truly possible. Um, on, your, on your first question, I think Harry Singh, his, his, his options were limited. But you could imagine a world in which the Maharaja of Kashmir was a much more sensible, much more considered person. And he could, Harry Singh wanted to make an, Kashmir independent. I think it, there, were, there were character flaws that he had. There was no way that India or Pakistan were going to make him uh, an independent country. 
I think a different Maharaja might have had more of a chance. I'm not saying that they would have had a different outcome, but I think they would have had a, a more of a chance. And what, what the, the interesting thing, actually, it, about Harry Singh was that he knew exactly what his power was. Under the Government of India Act, 1935, the, the Maharajas, the princes, had final say over what happened. And that was what the whole point about this chapter, about the individualism, was that everything depended on him. Mount Baffin, interestingly enough, a month before independence, flew up to Srinagar and tried to persuade him to join Pakistan, to accede to Pakistan. Uh, and of course, that didn't work. So that, that, that's what I was uh, trying to say. Now, your second point, it, that's a broad question about historiography anyway. You know, the historian is always going to be captured by his or her um, influences and education and background. But that doesn't mean you should try, and uh, uh, you should not try uh, for, to, to have some distance. You know, perfection may be impossible, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to improve yourself. Um, you could say, oh, well, perfection is impossible, so I'm going to be a really bad guy. I'm just going to indulge every vice I have. But uh, that, that, that isn't a particularly helpful response in history. And I think you've got to be very aware when you're dealing with empire with what the different arguments are. And, and, and I think, um, I, I mean, I've always hated Marxist history. I think it's far too crude. But I think an awareness of some of its arguments is important. Uh, similarly, in terms of neoconservatives, you know, I'm, I'm a conservative politician. I probably have, you know, I get on very well with Neil Ferguson. But again, I want to have some critical distance from, you know, his very um, sort of positive view of empire. And I think once you, once you have these two, um, you try and balance these forces, I think you're more likely to get to the truth. The truth is always uh, somewhere in the middle. It's never black and white. It's never um, crude and simple. And, and, and I think even though you might not get there, even though you are yourself, a pro as a historian, a product of a certain era, a certain background, I don't think it's a futile thing to try and get to, to something slightly more objective. And in India, truth, and in, at least in Hindu philosophy, truth is always grey. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, thank you very much, Kwasi. It was really much. a pleasure and privilege yeah, having thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was really cool. Individuals can mess up nations, and we have small gifts for you. Thank you, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience for this session. Uh, I request everyone who's leaving the room to make sure that you're also carrying your baggage, which includes any disposable glasses and paper plates, whatever you may have brought inside. Uh, please make sure that the venue is clean and also the uh, places outside. There are dustbins outside everywhere, uh, all over Diggy Palace. Please make sure that you throw your litter, whether it's loose paper and things, on, not on the ground, but into those dustbins. Thank you. There are a couple of venue announcements. The, ve the session out of Africa, which was planned at 3.30 to 4.30 in Tata Steel Front Lawns has changed to the Google Mughal tent at the same time and the session corner of